Hello and welcome to your favorite comic book YouTube channel, Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. And we are a daily comic book YouTube channel. So make sure you subscribe to our feed and go to our homepage on YouTube. Hit that little uh, magnifying glass to search and search out your favorite comic books or creators. We have over 1,400 videos. We've probably covered your favorite title, but if not... Give it a search and then leave a comment below so that we can add that to our reading list or we can move it up our reading list if there's some title that you want to see us cover. I also want to remind everybody that we have a Cartoonist Kayfabe Patreon with three different levels that will give you access to our videos early. And at the King Kayfaber level, you'll have access to our videos first, including our recording session. We've got a bunch of King Kayfabers sitting here watching us uh, get ready to go through this Wizard Magazine now. But being a King Kayfaber means you'll be the first one in line whenever we cover a video of a book that you need to add to your collection. If it's rare, if it's hard to find... You can get those before the prices go up and before they disappear completely. Had a couple guys in the chat room just say that they uh, bought copies of the vi the uh, comic that we just recorded right before we ma were making this video. Very nice. So you pull the trigger on the right one of those those uh, books, and uh, it'll pay for your Patreon for the year. So uh, without further ado, the fifth anniversary bash of Wizard. This is issue number sixty from August nineteen ninety six. Five years into Wizard magazine. I don't know when Wizard peaks, but man, they're near the height of their powers probably <laughs> at, at, at this point. And you see Bart Sears with a big Hulk cover uh, right off the bat blasting through a wall that is wallpapered with old Wizard magazines. It makes perfect sense. He was one of the sort of names that did original cover work for, uh, for Wizard pretty early on. I'm going to say this. If it weren't for Wizard, I don't know that I would know Bart Sears. That's true. He did a lot of work. He did the Brutes and Babes column. Oh, yeah. Kind of surprised they don't bring him back for some kind of a hurrah on that. You know, that was a big feature for me for a long time in the early Wizards. Probably the longest running, like, how to draw column in Wizard was probably Bart Sears, Brutes and Babes. Yeah, maybe, man. And uh, not worth, you know, it's worth n noting that uh, cartoonist Kayfabe is nearly five years old, man. So so it's like uh, we caught up. Yes. We, we've averaged about 12 issues a year or something. Thing. Maybe maybe we'll cut back on our wizard coverage now. <laughs> uh, maybe not. We got a couple more probably to go. Um, love this ad, Batman Grendel by Matt Wagner. This was cool when this came out because Grendel had been like locked up in legal turmoil for several years, and whenever it shakes free, you get new Grendel from Dark Horse, and you get the Batman Grendel cro Batman Grendel crossover. And this is part two. Like I it believe is. there's four total square bound books of uh, Matt Wagner doing Batman and Grendel. Yeah, man. Uh, the other is a uh, Grendel Batman. Which, which uh, you know, precedes this. Probably a book that we've gotten some comments on to cover, and uh, probably at some point we will cover it. I do have this one from the ad, but I don't have those others. Never seen them. Yeah, I don't think I have a complete all four issues, I, but uh, I, we'll have to see what we have, because it's a good-looking series. I think they were... Uh when we were kids, I think that those were, like, wall books. Pretty expensive to, to get your hands on. All right. Another fun piece here. We're coming off of maybe a couple of months removed, I think late 1995, Marvel and DC crossover and do great numbers. So you know what that means? Let's all do crossovers. Oh, yeah. And here we have Marvel crossing over with Image, bringing back some of their popular guys like Rob Liefeld, creator of X-Force and Youngblood. Bring him into the fold. Let's do a crossover of this. Smaller print, Stephen Platt, Roger Cruz, and many more. And Rod Stephen Platt getting the smaller print treatment. And, and I don't know what he does in any of those, but uh, Roger Cruz does the does the X Force uh, Young Blood joint, which which is super sad. Also, uh, when we looked through Young Blood number six with Rob Liefeld, what Rob was doing, and he admitted that you know he created that like Colonel Bravo and stuff riding on the Akira bike and shit, and he had the zappy eye and was this old old codger and all that kind of stuff, just cutting promos on Marvel. But what he would often do is he created this Youngblood logo that was the X logo, but just didn't have that piece. Mm -hmm. But now that he's making nice, it's almost like a P the peace sign. Or the Mercedes sign. Totally. But also, this is a, a piece of the deal for Heroes Reborn, it seems, because... Uh, there's the, there's the uh, Jim Lee wing of of these crossovers that are going down. They're going to be ads for the Deathblow Wolverine and stuff. I think uh, Platt does a Cable Prophet crossover, but somebody else inks it. Mm. And uh, I've looked at these a few times. Pull them out of those those dollar bins and look at them, and Probably leave them good. behind. Yeah, not not my fa not not my favorite. And that's saying a lot because there's not that much Platt out there. Platt was a supernova, and there really might be like less than five comics that that really are the sexy ones. There just aren't anchors that can keep up with Platt. Right. So you do get a little bit of a trade-off whenever uh, whenever you do that. 
All right, so, uh... <laughs> Dude, the, the letter from the cosplay girl is worth noting, man. Where, <laughs> That's where, true. Where she had an address, and uh, she's Paula. just, she's just uh, giving giving feedback on, you know, m different metrics. It's amazing. I'll run through a few of them. 571 total letters, 565 from males. <laughs> um, I think uh, 549 say they aren't geeks. Three from prisoners. I've gotten prison feedback, and it, it but fucking bummed me out real bad. Oh. A couple people sent in photographs, 41 photographs, 16 artwork. Um, five that appeared to be real psychos. Mm, poor kid. That seems like a low number. I would have guessed a little bit higher in your 571 well, fan mail from Wizard Magazine letters. Uh, uh, you know, like a Patrick Bateman, like sometimes they could hold it together in, in, in a letter amount of space, but you you meet these guys in real life, and, yeah, then, could, and then you're toast. Could be. Um, but they re-up, man. Here's another round if you want to write to Paula. Yeah, she's 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 into it. And I want to point out the the uh, the Peter David uh, Gary Frank Supergirl uh, comics. Like I, I supported this comic. I thought I thought Gary Frank uh, did did a really really great job. Cam Smith was his inker on the Hulk stuff. So that's the entire Hulk creative team right there. You know they have a couple of years worth of work together, and we've made mention before the, the Gary Frank Hulk. Maybe it was a story element you would know, like, but he was kind of like pussy-ish, you know, like just kind of like look like Professor Hulk. Here. Yeah, cleaned him up, took the monster out. Right. Yeah, and and you know, it's not not that cool. I want the monster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So go do Supergirl and give her that grunge look. That's fine. Yeah, and it and it was it was good. Like story wise, I can't remember a damn thing, but uh, Gary Frank always turned in like great artwork. I want to call attention to the uh, Radioactive Man uh, vid video that I did with. Uh, with Brian Moss, we, we called it something like uh, the deconstructionist superhero comic that you don't have that you need. And uh, those things, man, when we went to uh, IDES the day before, the dollar bins had so many uh, Radioactive Man comics of the ones that we were talking about. You will not find uh, <laughs> that many anymore there. Yeah, I have. Uh, I think I have the first issue of Radioactive Man, and it makes me want more of them. So it's pretty cool. Unfortunately, I, I may have blown my chance <laughs> by not scooping those up before that video goes out. Got to uh, come clean here and say James Rugg from Indiana, PA. Yeah, where you went to college. Where I was at at this time. Where you were at at that time. Cartoonist Kayfabe is brought to you by the books that we make. Jimmy has forthcoming Street Angel Princess of Poverty. It's a good companion piece to go along with Street Angel Deadliest Girl Alive. He's been self-publishing lately. True Crime Funny is 1986 zine. BW zine. If you didn't get these at Comic Cons, he's going to put them uh, live on his website in uh, late October. And the long out of print Hulk Grand Design. Scoop up those cop comics. I have the Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus coming to you. 10th anniversary. Make sure you scoop it up. Best book I ever made. The current focus has been Red Room. There are two trade paperbacks of Red Room that are out there. Trigger Warnings and the Antisocial Network. Just wrapped up the four issues of the final season, Crypto Killers, with the third issue containing a backup feature of my forthcoming daily comic strip. And X-Men Grand Design Trilogy coming out in November, collecting long out of print uh, X-Men Grand Design books that I put together before you is a healthy bibliography of a bunch of stuff that we have out on the stands today. Now that we're done paying the bills, back to the video. This is not me. Man, I think you were on the dust. <laughs> Jim Rugg was on the dust, man. Because there can't be... Listen, man, it's Indiana, PA. What, 30,000 people in that town? Yeah, that's probably generous. Yeah, and there's two Jim Rugs? Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, this is not, not my letter, but boy, it looks guilty. I don't know if I'll be able to convince any of the kayfabers or not, but I, I promise that is not me writing. Although I don't disagree with their points. Right, because it, it, it reads like you. <laughs> it reads like you when the cameras are off. <laughs> um, we always talk about letter art's always good. Nothing stand out there, but always good. It's amazing what how people would decorate those envelopes. Talk about a bygone time period. Um, more of these crossovers. Now we have the Jim Lee Wild Storm part crossing over with Marvel. Um, we're going to see Top Cow crossing over with Marvel. We did this Death Blow Wolverine, Aaron Ro Weisenfeld, Richard Bennett piece. So if you guys aren't familiar with this, I'd say check out the video. Very cool art in that comic. And it's fascinating because none of that comic looks like this. Not at all. This is like classic Wildstorm looking shit. And classic kind of like Wiesenfeld, like like the stuff that he was doing. You know, he would push those trunks super tiny, super giant legs, very butch. 
and uh, completely different approach. Go, goes Jeff Darrow with uh, that comic. Yeah, and it may be Richard Bennett influence on that comic. You know, he's doing like he's finishes, guy, I right? guess. So yeah, yeah, definitely a guy that does detailed work. So maybe that book deserves more credit on the Bennett side than the Weisenfeld. Wade leaves X Men, sites clash with Lobdell, and uh, well, you know we we made those jokes. Uh, what were we looking at, man? Like maybe like the um, X Men Alpha, like the th the thing that was like pushing us toward. Age of Apocalypse, and, and the joke was, like, how many jobber writers does it <laughs> require to, like, write this comic? Because I think probably Fabian's name was on that shit, too. And uh, it seems ridiculous that, like, like Wade, at this point, has at least 10 years of professional experience, gave Lobdell his first job, but uh, it's that confusing thing that you want to shake the editors, right? Because, like, Lobdell had the catbird seat with X-Men, because the cartoon was super popular, and that initiated some, probably uh, the bulk of the sales of X Men in that post post Claremont run. So he's the yes, he's the writer of a very popular comic. It has nothing to do with his talent. His talent fucking sucks. It's <laughs> it's trash comics, and 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 Wade does what he does. You know, like it's it's serviceable. And I never read a Mark Wade comic that I was like, oh, this is crap. But I also never read one where I'm like, this is the fucking ultimate. Well, this is uh, building on, I don't know if it was one issue ago or two, but Dan Jurgens had come in for a cup of coffee on a new Spider-Man book, Leaves After Six Issues. And I start to say, like, look at Marvel, whatever they're doing, because these guys are like, you know what, let me stay at DC and write, you know, Flash and Impulse in the case of Mark Wade. Uh, Teen Titans, I think, is what Jurgens is going back to. And it just makes me think, like, Marvel must have been just chaos and, and, at this point. Yeah, and we'll get into it with the, with the Bob Harris uh, interview, but... Wade very cogently and as a writer he's throwing shade without with like in a very subtle way uh and, and in a way that probably Lobdell doesn't even realize because the guy's ba barely a writer he's a sales guy uh but Wade says like I like to build my we build stories in different ways I like to build character and have them interact with plot which is the way Every great writer describes story construction. Plot is shit. This is Lobdell's quote. I write the plot around characters, whereas his tendency, Wade's tendency, is to try and shoehorn characters into the plot. I don't even know what that means in terms of what they're saying there. One is saying the word character ahead of plot, and one is saying plot ahead of character, but like... What does that actually mean? No, I mean... In, in I mean, terms of that sentence? Yeah, well, yeah, sure, but like, like the way Wade puts it, it's, it's just like... Like, the Marvel method is plot, you know, where you just have cool characters running around doing stuff. But if you don't have a character you care about, it's it's the the old the old Stephen King phrase is like, like, I, I make you care and then I give you a scare, he says, man. So it's like you have to build a character that somebody gives a fuck about and then you can put them in peril and then that's how stakes are created. There are no stakes in a Scott Lobdell comic. It's... It's uh, it makes for good imagery when jo Joe Mad is running around doing whatever the fuck he wants and having ninjas and and you know the steam demons and stuff like that, but it's it's uh, as surface level as could possibly be. Uh, K. Fabian Nicieza <laughs> taking on the editor in chief role at Acclaim, and uh, that is formerly Valiant Comics, and he is taking over. He's replacing Bob Layton. Did Layton replace Shooter? Because if so, like, he's there almost four years as editor-in-chief. Had no idea that he was there that long. I was thinking it was a revolving door of editors. Right. But, man, if Leighton was there that long, that's nuts. A lot happened in those three or four years at Valiant and Acclaim. Sylvester so leaves Image. I did not remember this. Oh, yeah. I, I would hear about this, like, when you watch the Image documentary. They don't name it here, but he has a problem with another Image guy. And in the documentary, it's Rob Liefeld. Right. Is who he says he has the problem <laughs> with. But this happens pretty quickly. And, uh... I'll be curious over the next couple issues of Wizard what exactly how this shakes out, how long it takes, because what's ultimately going to happen is Sylvester Liefeld leaves, you know, I think kicked out maybe, voted on, I think, by the founders, and Sylvester comes back. So totally. I, it's not a very long time period. No, no. And no, it's in that image documentary for people that want more info on it. Yeah, man. And I quote, and what what happened was, I mean, we can be specific because they don't get a specifics here, but it's public information now. Uh, Mike Turner's established. And he is a, a sexy top cow artist. Like, like he's he's one of those dudes that that is very very attractive. And Rob is poaching. Rob Rob is like 
calling calling like the top cow offices to get get uh you know Mike Turner's phone number and shit. And then the quote is uh, Mark Silvestri picks up the phone and says, "You know who this is? This is Mark motherfucking Silvestri." And then uh, he got really really pissed off about the poaching of his guys because maybe a couple others. You know, got got. I can't think of any who would have uh, turned heel and and w- w- work for a rival territory. <laughs> but but may, maybe or maybe it's just you know Rob extending those those hands because I think I think Rob was like very had a very 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 successful line and Top Show, Top Cow was just finding its footing with like Witchblade and Darkness and stuff. But it's earlier stuff with nothing really. Like it it was the the low man on the totem pole, so they probably couldn't compete financially with what Rob was putting together. And it, it was frustrating for him. He, he, Silvestri says like, like guys, it's, it's, I'm out. Like, like if, if I have to run this business and then be nervous that like another founder's poaching my guys, like, I just don't want anything to do with you. It's but, really interesting because this idea of like image breaking apart is mentioned by a few other image guys in here. Jim Lee, I think McFarlane might be quoted somewhere in this issue. So like, it's this thing that, you know, the sharks in the water are kind of circling this story of like image breaking up. Yes. So kind of interesting. You know, you wonder if there's a lot of turmoil behind the scenes that insiders know about, that there's this speculation and guys are doing different stuff. At this point, Liefeld has launched another company. Maximum Press yes. is, is operating and uh, Jim Lee has Amash Studios, which is still under the image banner, but is very independent or very much like almost his own publishing company. Totally. So there's definitely this this interesting growth in terms of the image guys and them playing outside of that image sandbox that was created in, you know, 90, 93, 92, 94 time periods. Yeah, for sure. When the bubble bursts and we're actually seeing, and it's mentioned a little bit here and in the, uh, homage comics, which is not homage studios as a different thing. We'll be getting into that in this episode also. But, uh, I think, I think in this, uh, Sylvestri piece, I think I'm pointing at it, the non-exclusive yes. distribution. So, yes. so, so that's very illuminating. Cause like, Whenever you know, let me give the rundown of what that is. Yeah. At this point, Marvel has purchased Heroes World, and they're going to distribute Marvel exclusively. I think that's mentioned in here because there are hiccups. Yeah. DC has gone exclusive with Diamond Comics. Image has gone exclusive with Diamond Comics, and Silvestri is now saying that Top Shelf will not be exclusive. Yes. And when we get to the Homage article with Jim Lee, Homage is not going to be exclusive to Diamond. So like. And it, the, the destruction of the distribution system of comics, which is happening, we're in the middle of it. These guys, I think, are starting to look around and go, oh, boy, this is not a good thing. These exclusive uh, distribution deals were going to wreck these distributors. And people, to me, this is guys looking around, smart guys, being like, second thoughts. We need to keep these other distributors healthy. Yeah, yeah. So Probably it's, too little, too late, but... Yeah, so so it, it, it makes sense when you... Because, like, as kids... It's like, well, why does Rob have, um, you know, Maximum Press? And then, and then he's he's promoting that in his image books. And, like, what's the point of that? And the point of that is that it just isn't contractually bound probably to those distributor deals, man. So so he was able he, – he was the first one to, to be able to use whatever distribution was out there. And then these other guys are going to kind of fo- follow suit off of, off of Rob's lead. This is kind of a fun thing to look through. This is the Wizard Awards, which were – Voted on by fans, so you get an idea of like the readers of Wizard where their interests lie. Yeah, this is just not nothing many stood years. out there, but it's a lot of kind of the pop. It gives you an idea of the popular stuff at that time. Yeah. Popular with fans. Yeah. Uh, little article on Ennis Garth Ennis, who is writing all kinds of stuff. You know, Preacher has really become a hit. It's going to be number one in our uh, back issues story back here, and it kind of lists all the stuff he's doing. Like Hitman, he's working for Vertigo, DC, Top Cow, and Wildstorm. Their Preacher specials. Uh, Unknown Soldier, Enemy Ace, Bloody Mary, part of the uh, the Helix sci-fi line that D- uh, DC is doing. Heartland, a one-shot with Steve Dillon. I picked this up not too long ago, but haven't read it yet. I'm very curious about these guys that do like a one-shot, like I've, a standalone. Seems cool. Yeah, I've had that sitting as a as a potential episode for a long time. You could convince me of that because I'm eager to uh, to dive into it. The Darkness with Mark Silvestri speaking of Top Cow going off on their own medieval spawn and Witchblade. So he's all over the place. <laughs> it's so funny because because he's a good writer and he's got to make sense as image bullshit. So like the the language. Um, I'm going to develop themes I first put forward in the just completed medieval spawn. Which place series it sounds like <laughs> he did too much work for her for his pay. Yeah, with those um, guys. Boy, he looks young in that photo. That's what it is, too, man. It's a young, ambitious uh, guy going for it. Yeah. 
memorial for uh, Siegel. He had died earlier in the year. This is not the announcement of his passing, but it's a memorial that DC has is holding for him. How about give him some ends, man? Barbed wire does not succeed at the box office. <laughs> we all know that, and we all knew that it was going to happen too. And then they talk about the other, uh, the other kind of failures and stuff. And it's like, yeah, Batman Forever. Oh no, uh, Batman Forever is success, but Judge Dread, Tank Girl, uh, Power Rangers, Street Fighter. And then somewhere there's going to be a, a talk about like that Captain America mm -hmm. uh, movie. I guess it will be in, in the retrospective stuff. But that time period, it's it's almost like the Hollywood was doing everything they could to make you not like the the comics, the the the, the source material. They were struggling to figure out how to do comics movies, they, especially the indie, the weirder stuff. Yeah, and and that, and that that part of Wire when it, it, like you just know when whenever Stern had private parts, the movie come out, he was actually having a lot of turmoil with his wife and stuff. But the whole movie is about how he's a loving father and stuff. And Ivan Reitman literally told him, "Yeah, you better chill out on that divorce for about two years because we're making a fucking ten million dollar movie." about how you're such a great father and stuff, and we got to do promo and stuff. Like, when when uh, when Pam Anderson is doing barbed wire, she was, like, very pregnant and stuff. And, and like, you know, the titties that you see in there, it's body double titties and shit. So, so they sh I think they show nudity, but, like, it ain't even her. And, and, and you just know that, like, the little spank-offs are like, eh, fuck it, it's not even Pam. Cause like, what, I actually haven't seen any what, of that movie. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> but like, what? Why would you? You? What's the other attraction to that? To that? You're so caught up in the barbed wire universe. If you have any standouts in these company updates, shout them out. You know, I don't have too much uh, that popped for me. Yeah, no. It's funny these like these news bites, but again, a lot of this stuff is very much of that time, and I don't know that it had long reaching uh, impacts in terms of comics history or again anything that really stood out to me too much yeah uh alice is leaving leaving uh probably his his like last uh marvel book excalibur he's going to be put concentrating on his efforts on uh wildstorm Stormwatch, which will then co convert into the authority right. pre pretty pretty you well know, over in the next couple of years so that's kind of a noteworthy piece i had a friend who really loved that run of Stormwatch. Mm -hmm. like maybe the, that's their fa favorite image comics and you see helix is now the name of this sci-fi imprint from dc comics and it's such a weird thing you know their science fiction comics now has a new name it's so weird the way that we would promote in comics imprints and publishers you know what i mean whenever you go stephen king you're not going I don't even know who this publisher is. Right. You know, like it's it's this thing that doesn't exist in other bits of publishing very much, but in comics, it's the biggest name on the page mm -hmm. is the DC imprint title. Yeah. So you got stuff so out of whack. You you, tra you trace it back, and and you you ask yourself like why, right? Like what what for? And I think Vertigo did really really well. Uh, whenever. But it happened so naturally. Well, you know? I mean, you can trace it back to like Marvel zombies and, you know, all the way back. Like, no, 30 like years. when I'm talking about imprints, I'm talking about a very, like, this is very specific. Oh, this is definitely a verdict, jumping on the Vertigo bandwagon. But, like, it happened naturally. Like, so, like, you know, Doom Patrol was out there doing weird shit. Alamore for years was doing weird shit with us, Swamp Thing. And then, no, no, Gaiman's Sandman was just a, a regular comic for a, a number of years, and then it just turned out that like there's, there's all these comics that are like kind of like of a, of a piece. So like let's create this imprint, and then that that obfuscates the comics code and all, and you know it just it creates a, a brand, but like this is trying to do it the other way, where it's like the brand comes first. Yeah, this is building the universe. This is ultraverse. It is. Yeah. Although the the creative team, like, there's a lot of great creators there. Yeah, but it's just it's an unnatural contrivance. So Dan Jurgens not happy with Spider Man heads back to DC to do a Teen Titans relaunch. Yeah, the promo isn't very interesting, and when they show the characters, it really lets you know that there are really two big moments in superhero comics. You know, there's the Golden Age, and then there's the Marvel Silver Age, and everything else looks like some off-brand bullshit. This could have been a Lightning comic, for for all I knew, you know? Like that. <laughs> Look at that, dude. And it's the names. So Risk. so now so now you got an old boomer trying to come up with like uh like image comic sounding names like like a prism with a y and stuff like that it just comes off real false yeah it's a fun uh or like the background of te new teen 
Titans, whenever uh, Wolfman and Perez launches them, it's kind of interesting to see just how that was lightning in a bottle. You yeah. Know, like that series went went totally. hard. And and Dan Jurgens' thesis of that new Teen Titans, and, and we weren't there, so we don't know, but his thesis was like, it wasn't Kid Flash, Robin, you know, the, the Wonder Woman girl sidekick. It was like Cyborg, Starfire, like the new characters are what made the new Teen Titans sexy. So I don't know if that's true or not. You know, I thought they, this is a fun game. Like, who's the artists on these pieces, man? Well, that's Gary Frank. Yeah. We were talking about him a minute ago. But but is that not Del Kion from, from that one uh, 300 It cover? does look like Del Kion. That totally looks like Del Kion. Uh, that is Del Kion. Yeah. But you know what? I get this is Gary Frank with yeah. the uh, Rick Jones, Liam Sharp on our Abomination. That's Liam Sharp also. Um, I'm not sure the Hulk. This is the Hulk She Hulk graphic novel, but just, I don't know who does that cover. I'm just gonna say Jusco, but I have no no knowledge on on that at all. There are burn esque elements. There is. The I face. wonder if it's, he uh, might do the color on top or something. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if that's the situation there. Ooh, looks like McFarlane leader coming in. Yeah, with the butt head. I think that's a Del Kion Doc Samson. And, and then no uh, no idea that last one. Yeah, I'm not sure of that and, either. And that looks like uh, John Romita Sr. I didn't even, I didn't even catch him. <laughs> yeah. Or, it's probably it's probably Trimpy. Starting to talk about the Spawn HBO series. I, I'm so shocked that it took so long. Because, Me too. Because we, there was absolutely coverage. Because they, they had some kind of like madhouse type like anime studio doing the work years ago uh, in, in our coverage, but it's just now kind of really taking shape. And, and to me, it, it's the Supreme Spawn. Like it's, we know, we know what McFarlane's capabilities are and things. And they got, you know, actual TV guys to kind of like bat something out that, that kind of makes some sense. And, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll replay that, um, often while, while I'm, while I'm drawing comics and, and it really holds up for what it is. It was a cool era because Bakshi had Spicy City, which was a, a an, an adult cart comic series. It was kind of like a noir, like a neo-noir, uh, like cr crime uh, show. And uh, so, so like there was, there was some movement in like adult cartoons and uh, you know, this, this fit in well, I think it, I think it did three seasons. Mm hmm. Um, so, you know, you get three hours pretty much of, uh, it was pretty produce. impressive to be like a nighttime HBO show. Yeah. Pretty amazing. But I was shocked too, with that timeline. Cause in my head, it was like this and the max and wildcats and savage dragon were all, you know, cartoons, early cartoons. Those have all come out. They have, you know, like, like this is max, a little bit later than I remember. Yeah. Max is on VHS tapes. This, this version of spawn, I think looks pretty good. Same with the Angela. Like it's interesting to see these characters stripped down. Yeah. I don't know how well you, you know, like. From an animation standpoint, it seems like this is nightmarish, totally. but it is kind of cool to see them stripped down into this, just like a line art version. You know, what's funny is I, I reading that Carl Barks conversations book, whenever he was taking tests to be an in-betweener and stuff, one of the tests is animate a waving flag. And so like, so that you get that, that, mm -hmm. uh, that cloth. And he was like, my flag looked like leather. Yeah. Uh, Shoot to Hurt, this is Rob Schrab's Scud, which is probably about a year or two into its run. Yeah, he's working on like issue 13 um, or something. Dan Harmon is, is mentioned in here for you guys that have kept up with uh, Rob Schrab and Dan Harmon have, as they have gone on to make some movies and TV shows and, and gone more Hollywood direction. This article makes me want to buy that omnibus because yeah. I can't imagine putting together the issues. And I haven't read the series. I have a few issues. I love some of his work. Right. You know, I often talk about Heat Vision and Jack. And I like the designs of Scud, so I think I need to just break down and buy that that omnibus and read it from the beginning. I looked at a bunch of interiors, uh, just just um, you know, like we we did some of the features re recently where he where he was covered. Yeah. And I'm sorry to say it, but unanimously, his co the color pieces that were like on covers is so strong, and he does not use this level of work on the inside. He just doesn't, and it's unclear. And it's amateurish uh, in in a, a lot of it. I don't know if he grows up in, as a cartoonist. But the more I read this, it's like clearly, you know, this guy, creative fella, cr you know, interested in making stuff. He's nowhere yet. So pen and paper, I'll make a comic. But it, it's no different to me than when some Hollywood guy comes in who is established and is like writing comics. Like, like uh, 
it's 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 that level and you could clearly tell like and he hasn't really come back right so so uh it's a hollywood dude that's dabbling in our medium homage comics ad here we're going to see the uh you buy some ads you get some feature inches right that's it that'll be coming up hulk animated series I don't have too much to say about any of this nah, stuff. Nah, this is cartoonist kayfabe, and, and we don't mean, uh, you know, animated shitty cartoons used to sell toys. There's your homage article. So, Jim Lee kind of outlines some of the differences here between if you're doing a book with image versus if you're doing a book with homage, and homage is a little bit more hands-on in marketing and things like that. So, if you're a creator, basically you can focus on the creative part, and they'll do some a little bit more of the heavy lifting of the uh, the business promo distro behind the scenes. Yeah, he he, he lays out the difference between being an homage comic and being image proper because there's stuff that stays image proper grew stage bone. bone they stay image proper and and he sort of like lays out the differences but i actually wonder if there are even more differences if if there's like some sort of split you know at the end uh, that would when make it comes sense. To royalties and stuff. I would, I would expect that would make sense if you're getting more services from the publisher. I assume the publisher is going to take a little bit more of the, uh, a little bigger piece of the pie. Yeah. I'm trying to think of what other titles they ended up publishing. You know, Astro City had been an Image comic the yeah. first six issue run, and now it's going to be under this Jim Lee banner. Um, Strangers in Paradise, of course, self publishing, and now he kind of talks about like the success of that book had gotten to a point where like he. My book had gotten to the point where I couldn't do it anymore. The business yeah. end was taking up so much of my time that I couldn't do what I was supposed to be doing, which is write and draw. So it's pretty interesting the position that Jim Lee has created here. Because it does sound like if you're a successful self-publisher, this may be a great service for you. It goes with my thesis that I've said on the channel innumerable times, man. Like if if, if it's 10,000 copies or more, uh, it's, it's worth delegating some of that responsibility. Like, right. In my self-published WYSIWYGs, man, I, there's like oh, there's thirty thousand of them that I sent myself, and what that looks like is spending all day at the post office, and then at night getting some drawing time in, and then filling envelopes up that you take out the next day. I ain't complaining because that should happen during that like uh, subprime mortgage two two thousand eight bust, and I made I, I did well for myself. But I don't think I have the energy to do that as a 40 year old man, which is what Terry Moore is at this point. You know, he's yeah. 40 years old. And like I think about that and the, re the reality of that is not something that I would be interested in tackling myself. Yeah, in this article, you're basically seeing glimpses of each of these books. Leave it to chance on the previous page, Strangers in Paradise and Astro City here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the interesting thing, thing about Leave it to Chance is uh, it, it, it reads like Robinson and, and Paul Smith made the comic and they were kind of showing it off to different places and you know the jim lee brand you know makes the makes the best deal this is one i'm curious to kind of revisit i have some of those issues i don't know if i've even read them but they're the single line comics and i'm such a fan of that kind of like man single line means there's nothing to hide behind it, it, there's a little bit of computer coloring for sure yeah. but that single line is where you can really see drawing yeah but it does not look like inspired comics at all i have a couple too and it's just like i'm not there's nothing about it that makes me stoked to read it. I don't know what this is. Yeah, he's in everything. What a what a prime spot to get like two pages in Wizard magazine uh -huh. as a cartoonist. Yeah, he's like he's like the wizard Fred Hembeck. <laughs> it's yeah, it's hard. I feel like that's an insult to Fred. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. This, this is this is cool because like uh, so hundred comics every modern uh, day collector should own because this gives us a little bit of. Uh, template of like future episodes that we got to do I thought that too and and we've covered a lot of it yes we've covered a lot of it so like stuff like Astro City that would probably be a Sunday video mm -hmm. like rather than do issue one like do the six That's I don't have those well you know di digitally even or a trade paperback uh this the Spider-Man I don't know yeah, I don't know that one. And Animal Man 15, I was surprised that's the one they would uh, hot shot. Makes me curious to read it because yeah. I haven't read that run. Yeah, you would have thought that it would be the Coyote Joint, which we did do an episode on. We did episodes on Batman Year One, of course, Dark Knight Returns, Killing Joke. We did a couple on those, mm -hmm. like those Captain Americas. Uh, I'm curious about what that is. We did Daredevil 181. 
We Daredevil born, born Again. Yeah. The Trial of Galactus came up in conversation at Baltimore. I'm ready for this one. Yeah. And and you know what? To be fair, I don't have these comics either, I but do. I'm very curious to read those. But so uh, if you got them. They're needles in haystacks, and if I come across them, I'll, I'll, I'll pull, pull them out. Them. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to be the same deal. Like, if I find them somewhere in a dollar bin, I'm going to grab them. But uh, if you find yours, I can certainly read the digital, and then we can go at it. Mm-hmm. Hulk 340, like I say it all the time, this is a fantastic issue. That's the McFarlane Wolverine fight. Yeah. It's really well done. Don't quite know the two, like I, I'm, I probably read 258, which is another burn. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to sit here and read it, like the synopsis, but that might be when the infinite, the infinity gauntlet that came out when we were kids and when we were picking up like our extinction agendas and, and all, all of that stuff. <clears throat> but I just glanced by it. Like I never, I never gave that stuff a shot because to me it was all the also rans, mm-hmm. and it would be guys like Star Fox and shit, like characters that you just don't give a fuck about at all. It's amazing how that has like come around to be such totally. a huge MCU, like the movie stuff. Yeah, I remember hearing uh, it, it. It helped those guys a lot over the years that this became as popular as it did it's in terms in- of royalties and things, which I like to hear. Yeah, it's interesting because what this was during our time was a nostalgia piece for the older fans who liked Starlin in the 70s. So we had no context for, for, for that at all. And we were on that Todd McFarlane tip and that Jim Lee X-Men tip. But, like, it would be the older heads that were fucking with that. So, like, as time has gone on, the older heads are built in. They love that shit. But some of us must have fucked with that. Because, I mean, you would see it all the time. Very arresting images, certainly. Yes. Yeah, look cool. Um, the, the George Perez joints and stuff. Unforgettable, iconic imagery. I don't know the Iron Man 149, 150. There's a really good run. I think it's towards the end of 150, like 159 around there. Three issue fight with the Hulk. That's really great. Where Iron Man like uses all the power in his suit to knock the Hulk out. Uh, Marvel's one to four. We've looked at that one. A lot of past videos here for people to choose from. Exactly. Anatomy lesson swamp thing. We've done that. Yep. It's it's interesting what gets like a big chunk of issues and what gets one issue because you could probably highlight several of the Alan Moore Swamp things. Absolutely, man. Uh, yeah, I was actually just talking about this with somebody, and and they actually cited the anatomy lesson as like they clenched their pillow and like couldn't believe it. You know, like just completely rethinking that character. Sandman one through seven, we did uh, several videos of that. Yeah, and that's one where I think if you're gonna do like a great Sandman story, I'm not sure those are the seven issues that's you would point somebody at. That's the truth. It's a very like questing uh, by the numbers type of a comic. Superman twenty twenty one. I don't think we did those, but we did the porn tape one. Right. Um, this is the end, I guess, of Burns' run on Superman. It sounds like from the description. So I'm kind of curious about that. Me and Tom did Superman Annual Seven like in year one of uh, Cartoon Escape Channel. Uh, super annual 11. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think that was probably when you were at Angolem, whenever that was. Um, tells the teen Titans. This is that Judas contract. We have not covered this, but I think I have all of those except annual three. I, I have an issue or two. Perez's art, man. I don't know how that guy drew that much stuff in a month. And then you're like, man, we ain't even close to a hundred issues yet. Right, and so here we go with, with Thor, where you get, like, more than a year's worth of issues. And, and look, Walt Simonson, Thor, badass. But again, like, one issue of Alan Moore Swamp Thing. And, and the whole know. run of uh, <laughs> yeah. Simonson's Those Thor. are great, though. Yeah. yeah. And we haven't covered any of that. By the way, so are the Kirby Thors. You know, like, you could do this list with... You could probably do several of these, like, 100 comics to own oh, lists. Oh, totally. Of course. You know, no Ditko Spider-Man in this list. Like, there's just a lot of stuff that's not in here. X-Men gets quite a few, and, and all kind of from that same run, like that, that burn run. Totally. It's the Proteus story, it's uh, the Dark Phoenix, and then Days of Future Past. We did a Days Classics. of Future Past uh, joint. Yeah. It's funny what they cite as the, uh, as the Dark Phoenix saga, because it's like three issues, but it's really like spread out over a very long time. It's also interesting at this point where like they're doing reprinted as classic X-Men issues, like before everything is collected in trade paperbacks and omnibuses, you would get like issue reprints, right? Which is kind of a, a different era. Yeah, yeah, and that, that Walt Simonson Thor had got none of it. Yeah, Watchmen one to twelve, of course. Uh, we've, we've done that in great detail. Dave Gibbons yeah. sat with us for issue twelve, exactly. And then uh, a few extras here, you know, if you want to supplement that list with some stuff, comics best kept secrets, stuff like Miracle Man. Uh, Magnus Robot Fighter Valiant. You know, they reprinted some of the Rest Mannings. How about those if you're going to track down some Valiant Magnus uh, Robot Fighters? I feel like those would be a time better spent. Miracle Man 1 through 16. West Coast Avengers in a chat was like, yo, Thanos Quest is badass too. Guess what, man? It gets the, uh, it's a comics best kept secret in this article. Yes. 
uh, Elementals, the, yeah. the uh, classic Kamiko series, gets a gets a shout out there. So some fun stuff. Hawkworld, I love that they say the gorgeously illustrated, dark and graphic origin tale of Hawkman. That's Tim Truman doing some cool stuff. Whenever I, uh, everybody was getting like the '80s revamps, that was the Truman uh, book. I look at it every day. I'm in my comic room. Like when I'm back there, I'm just like, man, we need to do Hawkworld. That's a really cool Doctor Fate looking. Uh, it it image. looks like computer. It doesn't even look like paint. All right, man. The Jim Lee, Rob Liefeld, Heroes Reborn stuff. I think they get several pages every issue of Wizard. Wizard has stock in uh, uh -huh. something at this point. These are now sketches that that uh, Liefeld and Lee have done of some of these characters, and then little tiny notes on what they're thinking, where they're coming from. You know, having a female Bucky, uh, just kind of kind of wetting our whistle. We want this. You know, yeah. like this clearly has uh, spiked interest. So give the fans what they want and. There's not a lot out yet. The books aren't out yet, so just keep giving us whatever we can. With the big um, image thing happening, and at this point, it's like four or five years old by that point, and history, like, the the explanation of what image was over that four or five year period, it really changed uh, b from public perception. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the firm stances that Todd McFarlane has, where he's like, I'm never going back to Marvel. Fuck that shit. I'm running my own business. Uh, Image Comics is forever. Even if I just have to put it on my own books, Image Comics will always exist, blah, blah, blah. And I think people took that as like a blanket boilerplate for like all the Image guys. So this was a big deal because the everybody thought that the, bur the, the boats were burned whenever Image was created. And as we do these videos, there's never once been a moment where Rob Liefeld says that like he's done or anything like that. He, he and he he said that like I would go I would go back under the right conditions and do things, you know, under the right conditions. And so I think um uh, I think a part of the deal with this like revamp stuff really is those uh those uh, team up books and things and you really hot shot your own brand if you put, you know, your young blood characters with X-Men. Like that that's a uh, that, that'll do well for you as, as a holistic business. We'll have to keep an eye on that top 100 list as we go forward and see how those books perform. Yeah. See if it's diminishing returns. But after the Marvel DC stuff and the plummeting sales, like, everybody's looking for any kind of life raft. Sure. And, you know, those things definitely spiked. And this is spiking. You know, attention-wise, this is doing... It's making a lot of noise. We'll see how how that sustains, but it's making a lot of noise. I love that Hulk drawing. Yeah, it's a cool it's a cool drawing. This is that old school Hulk of just like that wide at wide as he is tall monster, which is my favorite kind of Hulk design. And that's that's what Jim Lee talks about in here, you know, in the notes that go with this. Is he likes that savage version version, not the bodybuilder version that has become uh, the character as late of late. Bob Harris, he's uh, taken the role of editor-in-chief, and so you get to hear him talk through some of Marvel stuff like the uh, Spider-Clone. <laughs> Two years of that. And, Two years of that, and that is just a punching bag in Wizard Magazine. And he's just like that fucking middle management speak, this whole article. It's it's very boring, and, and you know, it's the reason why I have, like, no interest. Like, if Jim Lee hit, hit me up and was like, C can I do an interview on your channel? Like, I would be like, hey, Jim, you want to go interview fucking Jim Lee? You guys could handle that because he's not going to say anything and he's just promoting and, like, would use the opportunity. Like, Harris says nothing in here that is anything but company line boring bullshit. So, like, he's even defending the Spider Clone saga um, and spinning it in corporate speak to try to get his way out of that paper bag. Oh, it just proves that character that people really, uh, you know, they adore these characters and blah blah blah. But just you know, clearly not admitting that it was a mistake, it was shit. One thing that is interesting, though, man, is that on top of the editor in chief duties, which I bet are kind of immense, he's still editing some X books. So he's delegating, so, you know, probably you know, gets paid for those too. On top of uh, his his editor in chief duties. So yeah, keep your name on the biggest books. It's funny, too. It reminds me a lot of, like, we saw Valiant interviews early in the Wizard coverage where it'd be, like, Steve Mazarski talking about Valiant. Very similar speak. You know, we were critical of that interview back then, and it feels like, you guys are going the wrong direction. Yeah, this yeah. company tanked, and now you're copying copying the way they present. Uh, Lady Death Half still have the coupon in mind. Same. Nobody's going for that uh, Steve Hughes joint. 
Uh, I didn't pull anything from any of this stuff. It's just what's going on with kind of the bigger, more popular books. Yeah, the heat is on is the title of the article, and just telling you where where, where things are gonna are gonna go, uh, where where things are heading. But when you see stuff like a spawn amongst all of the uh, or a preacher. Yeah, well, like, you know, that's still a DC comic. You know, I still am just very impressed by self-published comics or, you know, independent comics. How many, every issue of, <laughs> I that's told the you, image. I told you, it's been f four issues at least. Like, this image gets repurposed so much. How an issue of Wizard is made in 22 easy steps. Uh, I don't have too much to say about this. You know, it goes from uh, basically these take longer than a month to make. You by, know, you, you sort lot. of lay out your your concepts, and then you got to run down the content. You know, which may mean interviewing people, research, gathering art, and uh, putting putting it together. Yeah, you get to see Bart Sears kind of working on the on the page there. Yes, cover needs to be done early. Rough rough pencils. Wish that was a bigger image, but rough pencils of this issue's cover. And but these are the guys who are guilty for this magazine, you know, and you know it's all all kind of Packerwood type dudes, and uh, so the, so the mag reads like you would expect these guys to create, you know, the magazine. Just goofy. <laughs> Pam Anderson cut out. Yeah, of course, some is funnier seeing like their setups. The the old computer stuff is really fun for me. Yeah, they got cubicles and shit. And look Some at of these cubes are nuts. And look at this pasty fella <laughs> who has to do the price guide stuff. Yeah, that dude doesn't get out in the sun much. And that just has to be... That's just the biggest sham ever, too. Because, like, I told you about that one documentary with the with the trading card stuff. The, the You know, the wax junk era. And the people from Beckett were like, we like arrows. Because, like, like, rather than, like, the pinks and the greens that are in Wizard, it would be up and down arrows for the fluctuating value of uh, baseball cards and shit. So, I mean, this guy is just like, well, I got to make, make sure I get some greens and blues and reds on every page. You know, it's all nonsense. Yeah, if you're interested in this kind of process stuff, there's a good one on Saturday Night Live, like the making of an episode of that in a week. Oh, yeah. I think that might be on, you might be able to find that on YouTube. I don't know if that was officially released, no. but you can find it if you dig. Yeah, it was James Franco's uh, thesis for, for NYU, but it's hard to find because... Type in Saturday Night Documentary, yeah, right. like, good good fucking luck. There's also one on This American Life that they did as a premium giveaway comic that's kind of cool, and I think that's like eight months lead time for an episode of that. So all this stuff that we consume in, you know, 20 minutes of reading a magazine or watching a, listening to a half-hour radio show or whatever, months and months of preparation for this yeah, stuff. Yeah, like, dude, we're at day 105 for, for an issue. That's 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 three months and change to, yes. for, for, for a single issue. This was last uh, Wizard episode, but we we used the she cover. Yes, I think it's a terrible. It's a, it's Joe Casada, and we'll and we'll look at that cover close closer in this one. It's a terrible cover for for what it is, man. We'll get to it. It's Superman in a bubble bath. <laughs> All right, this is. Um... Ed, before we started recording, you made a comment to the King K Fabers. We've got 59 hours of this. Right. This is a recap of basically since Wizard has been publishing uh, the big stories, the big artists. It's it's somewhat like with the artists and the writers, almost the same from year to year. You'll see a couple new names, and usually they'll come out of this on the rise. It's kind of funny to see things like the uh, top grossing films, best pictures, things of that nature. I enjoyed reading through this because a lot happens in the five years that I don't remember. And they do stuff like pop culture, like Magic Johnson retiring because of HIV. Um, there's stuff about O.J. Simpson when we get there. So it does kind of like paint a picture of what's going on. And uh, memory wise, I don't have this stuff all straight. So it was kind of interesting going through some of that. Um, Batman Returns kind of gets lambasted. I think one of these, I think it's in this article, it might be later, where they just, they pan it for being, you know, terrible flop or whatever top grossing film that year which i believe the uh the next batman movie also top grossing film that year i don't know if batman's ever laid an egg at the box office right but they are shit movies well yeah i'm not defending that but you could say that about a lot of the top grossing movies but uh batman performed at least in terms of uh compared to all of its other stuff you know like here 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 we go this is the batman returns Classic disaster is more like it. Well, it's still number one film of the year. So, I, I, you know, the, best, the most successful movie that came out that year. Yeah, just fanboy talk. 
It's funny how that happens, you know, that you have this sort of narrative around something. Well, I mean, it sucks. So it's like they're being emotional. Like they're not, you know, they didn't make money off of it. Like they, they paid money to go see something that they wanted to see and it's a piece of shit. So, I mean, you know, I get it. It makes sense. I bet the accountants weren't, uh, di didn't care. Yeah, the accountants didn't write the article, Jimmy. That's true. You know, like Brandon Lee dying on the set of The Crow. It's it's crazy how much is in here for five years. Like, this so feels crazy. like my childhood. You know, maybe would have been a fifth, uh, third of my life at this point. Yeah. You know, it's like a lifetime, and it's five years. And I'm so young. Like, like I remember that morning, because, like, you know, I go to bed at 9 or 10 on school nights and stuff. And that, would, that was the talk of the news the next day. And I just couldn't. How does that happen on a set? And then in the span of cartoonist kayfabe you know that alec baldwin shit happened and it's just it's unbelievable that that's even possible because like even with a toy gun like you don't really point it at people as like a adult so it's like why wouldn't you do every check and balance yeah totally you know this is something that i remember was a mystery to me there was the announcement of continuity comics doing todd mcfarlane spawn crossover and neil adams Valer valeria she bat number three yeah and it's never published and no. so they mention it here and then they're going to follow up i don't know a year later or, or at some point that uh that's canceled but i never never got the official cancellation until now right also it's funny to think of guys like this is all of dave lapham's career <laughs> yeah. and it goes through valiant defiant and stray bullets you know right. like like a lot happens in this time for, for you know different arcs for different people yeah you see defiant and then the dark horse superhero universe is oh yeah is man ultraverse and dark horse you know one month after the next <laughs> they're funny though they have 12 books for 12 bucks i think it was 16 books for 16 bucks i think mm. i think i feel like there were four sets of those things Image Axis titles and legend is formed. There's so much going on here. Jack Kirby passes in 1994. Yeah, yeah, I definitely encourage people, man, go to our magazines playlist and j just start it from episode one. Especially the makers out there, man. That's good company while, while you're drawing comics, which is sort of an impetus for making this channel. They they track wet works being you know about two years from its announcement until it's ac actually shipped. Yeah, you see Jim Carrey's Mask, one of those early superhero uh, success films uh, on the indie side too. Absolutely, Dark Horse. Gen thirteen with thirteen variants. Hugh Grant getting caught with a prostitute. That was such a big story because Liz Hurley was his girl, and he was caught with like not even just a prostitute but like a crackhead. And that, I mean, that speaks a lot about, you know, how things go sometimes, man. Dude had a supermodel girlfriend and, and that, that didn't juice him up enough. Tops universes, Generation X movie, and they, they should, they should or not suitably. Ah, turn it off, turn it off is the caption. Right. You know, Alan Moore shows up later than I realized with some of these books. Like here, he's taken on Wildcats. Um, the page before, which was also 95, has spawned Blood Feud. Uh -huh. I was thinking like he did 19, 1963 and 1993 and then was just like all over all these different image books. And there was some, there was a gestation period there. Yeah, I guess so, huh? Amalgam. Yeah, Amalgam and Marvel versus DC. We're pretty much caught up. Like, like uh, Kingdom Come is still coming out. Kind of a weird bonus, right? What does this have to do with Wizard, the, uh, the black and white Jim Lee Batman cover? Yeah. I'm sure everybody loved it, but it's just weird that it's included here. Totally. Yeah, there's no context. Maybe that'll come next issue. Possibly. Although I think black and white is done. I think issue four might be listed in this issue, you know, in their uh, mm. comics to watch or whatever. And I feel like that book did not get much coverage. No. You know, it didn't have a special feature and all those artists. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was a weird thing. And I don't know that it, it, it sold so great at the time, but I, th I think, you know, like how there's like box office and then video. I think that, um, that book did amazing in trades. Yeah. Yeah. You would think so. I mean, it spawned several sequel volumes. So. Right. Must have done all right for DC. It's a cool format. I remember loving it. I think I bought some of those off the stand. Like it even had newsstand distribution. Um, I didn't spend any time on this. You know, you can kind of hit the headlines for what this stuff is, but it's it's wizard looking five years in the future, and most of it's them being silly. I think. Yeah, totally. This is noteworthy. American artists will be studying the work of Masamuno Shiro. 
so 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 I was I was here, man. I was buying this yeah. this magazine, right? And and this stuff was pretty meaningful. And like the most meaningful piece was uh, the Image Comics as we know it will be no more. And at the time, I think I was like, "Ah, oh, you guys are nuts." You know, like of course they'll still be there, even though like we you saw the the Silvestri thing earlier. But I mean, just look at what's been what's playing out. Rob and and Jim are doing this Marvel stuff. Uh, we knew that it was for a finite period of time, but you never know what 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 comes from that. Like over time, it's pretty clear that McFarlane's just going to keep doing his his uh, his own image stuff. He's not really interested in doing the uh, the Spider Man stuff, but he hedges and says, you know, never say never. Fifty seven channels with nothing on. Try the Comics Network. Uh, now there's like nine hundred channels, and uh, there's still no Comics Network. No, but what what they're citing is like you could play like all the old classics, and Sci Fi Channel would kind of do that. Like uh, they would have the Mighty Marvel Marathon, and um, it would be like three whole days of like every Marvel thing that existed, all the Ferrigno movies, and every episode of the show, the Spider Man ones. Right, you'll see chains of Marvel Entertainment stores. I think that's just a matter of the brick and mortars, like malls going away. Yeah. Otherwise, I think you might see those now. I think they tried to do that, and I think that that was like part of like uh, their, the hero their world. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. Man, this is the idea that Superman's going to somehow be great never uh, that never lands. Tomorrow's writers will not come from comics, and that and that 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 bears out. But like the way that it works, it's just stunt casting. You know, get the, the guy who wrote First Blood to do a Captain America comic or get, uh, you know, ta Coates, the son of a Black Panther, to write Black Panther. I like their examples of true writers like Peter David. Oh, I know. Um, traditional artists will become obsolete. I suppose that's happened. Yeah, for sure. And and it's gone farther than they realize because they're, cause they're just talking about inkers and, and coloring and stuff. And now you have like, you know, AI shit. So my, my takeaway is the manga influence is what they really nailed there. Basic training, how to draw a killer cover. So this is the wizard cover that you're uh, talking about a minute ago, Ed. This is Joe Quesada walking through the creation of last month's Superman cover, starting with rough thumbnails, very, you know, draw them small, draw them quick. Yeah. Uh, pretty common method there. Get your layout, what actually goes on, size, logos, all of this stuff. Um, very true. Companies usually will just provide that so you know exactly what you're dealing with. And now he's blowing up these roughs and talking about which ones work and why and what doesn't. Yeah, and, and they all work like better than the one that they ended up with. But I describe uh, this cover. This cover to me is Blue's Hammer, like from, <laughs> from, from Ghost World, because you're really trying to like update a vestigial icon and it comes off very silly. I wonder if Quesada feels that way because he's he he kind of talks about like there's just it's hard to do a Superman by himself because it's basically it's been done everything's been done with Superman. Yes. So the takeaway. So if he's supposed to be flying through clouds, I believe, but I've never thought of it as anything but him in like a hot tub with steam and like a bubble bath. That it does look like steam. But also. The black, like the shadow face and all that stuff, it doesn't have any like Superman qualities and the black all over it. Like he's clearly trying to do something that set, sets his Superman apart from everybody else, but it's the silliest tone, you know, like that's why I call it Blues Hammer, dude, because, you know, it's the electric guitar version of uh, the Delta Blues. Yeah, there's some disconnect, I think, between your, uh, your artist and your colorist. Um, he talks... I was hoping it was here, but I think it's somewhere further in that he had to put the mullet on him. Everybody was against the mullet. We talked about the animated Superman, and that was a point of contention with them of not having the mullet and fighting with them. And Quesada apparently didn't want to do the mullet, but was told, you know, that's that's the deal. Because he's in bands and stuff. And, <laughs> and like, if you look at him, you know, he looks like Donnie by the docks. Like he's a stylish dude for the time and stuff. And the mullet when that when who the liked mullet the mullet? Out, it was like, not like DC cool. corporate was like mullet Superman, and nobody seems yeah. to be in favor yeah, of that. Yeah, just chicks that like that. She's my cherry pie song. Fucking like to some dudes with mullets back in the day, but I feel like it was out at that point. All right, uh, Palmer's picks. Tom Hart is the subject here. I'll be honest, I have read almost no Tom Hart. Um, he would do a series called Hutch Owens when I started reading com alt, alt comics. Yeah. And like Top Shelf would distribute those is how I would see them at like say SPX. They'd have like a, a box of what they're distributing. That's the extent of my Tom Hart would be seeing some of the Hutch Owens stuff. Yeah, totally. And I think that that was, that's a late period 
weekly, it's definitely, weekly strip. Definitely after this stuff. It's a we it's a it's a alt weekly strip, like one of the kind of last vestiges of those. Um Hacho in a character, he is listed here. So it is a character that Tom Hart has done, like I think several works with. The Sands is the series that he's doing at this point about some couple that moves to the Middle East for uh, the woman is studying bugs there and the dude's kind of wandering around and having little adventures locally. Um, it's, but, re- it's really cool because because like as comics are just plummeting, it's beautiful that you have cartoonists with no major kind of profit motive. Like with this kind of aesthetic and shit, you know, you're probably not going to attract a big, big readership of like 1996 right. comic readers, but he's still doing it. And that really opens some doors for us. There's some interesting talk here where he gets into, like, clearly he's also a formalist. Yeah. But he talks about trying to balance that to make it reader friendly. And I think that that's something to be, like, conscious of whenever you're, especially if you're doing something that's a little more formally experimental. Yeah. Don't forget your readers. Yes. And, and Hart talks about that. Yeah, that's everything to me, man. Because, like, when you go to, like, SPX and you see people just trying to impress other cartoonists with their, like, little devices and stuff, it's trash. But uh, this is also, I mean, just take a look at that. We're getting to that stage of like the famous, uh, you know, craft is dead conversation. And, Hutch, and and Tom Hart is a part of that, you know, like yes. clearly his work fits into that rubric of like, just make comics, you know, make them, get them done. Because right. like, like ultimately that's the conversation. It's not like, don't be meticulous like Dan Clowes. It's like, just make comics. Like there's more than one way to make them. Definitely. And the other piece that I liked out of this, there's a lot of Tom Hart interview mixed into this column is he talks about getting a light box, adding a light box to his tool set for redrawing panels and moving panels around like page layouts easily. I think that's, it's always fun to hear the, uh, the, the shop talk tool talk <laughs> part of that stuff. Because it would be a tragedy to, to erase this and then redraw it. It's too hard to redraw that. <laughs> Uh, trailer park usually don't spend too much time here but a couple of things to note anti-gravity room getting a second season 26 episodes of the first season did not realize it was that big of a run i i got a i got more hunting to do i only got 16 episodes on my little uh database man so so i need to find the others so that's pretty cool and the other part kevin smith doing uh chasing amy being called out here Mike all read part of that. Yeah. And um, this was a big movie to me at the time. Totally. And, and I'm actually kind of eager to go back and revisit it. It's been many years since I watched it. We should do a review on, on the channel. Uh, it talks about how Mike Allred gets gets the first line of the movie. Do you remember what that line is? I don't. I do. So it's that Ethan Sup- Supley guy. Yes. The big dude. Uh, That's a good fanboy. I assume he's a fanboy. Yeah, yeah, totally. That's a good fanboy cast. Or or actually, like, he comes later. But anyhow, uh, Allred's talking to fans. And uh, Mike Allred signs his comic, closes it, it, gives it to the guy. And he's like, I love Chow Yun-Fat. I just don't see him playing Madman. (laughs) (laughs) This was such a crazy movie to me just because, like, I had never seen that version of comics on a screen, let alone, like, a movie, like, a widely released movie. Um, Pretty revolutionary in that way. Like, like one of the first, probably, as comics really become, like, Hollywood accepted, has to be one of the first things to show that comic book convention kind of weird culture that's all i wanted like like it's two movies you know yeah. and and i just want, wanted the comic part there's a lot of comics in it you know a lot more than than you would typically get in uh in anything else yeah the the studio setup is dope too because their drawing tables are yeah. on the incline facing one another so like the anchor's on one side and he's like this is the best street light you ever yes. drew <laughs> and then and then ben affleck's like oh yeah that's the one across the street from the by the bank mm-hmm. And uh, Jason Lee's like, oh, looks just like it. Yeah, that's fantastic. Also, Jason Lee's a big part of that, too, because he was in Mallrats, too. And, mm-hmm. like, I had skateboard tapes with that dude where he's, like, singing songs and shit. Definitely the most charismatic dude on these old skateboard tapes. The uh, That article says that it's th- that All Red helped with that studio setup, kind of based on his studio. So, Oh, that's that's pretty fun. Fun, uh, fun, fun stuff there. All right, getting into like a comics picks. Monkey Man and O'Brien is uh, finally getting its its release, its uh, official miniseries release here. One and done comics, single issues complete. Uh, he has two issues done and is working on the third. So, so uh, just to let everybody know that, like you know, it will be it will be coming out. I had these on my pull list and and uh, definitely got them like the second that they came out and stuff. Yeah, it was a big deal. Yeah, really cool. It was exciting to buy 
Art Adams like new comics. And his own... I, I don't know what all he had released from the time I started reading until then. Like New Fantastic Four was Art Adams comics I bought off the newsstand. Yes, yeah, but days... after that, I don't know. Might have been a, a little while. Yeah, there was like Days of Future Past. No, what Days of what, What's the old one called? The burn one. Days of Future. Days of Past. Future Past. And this one was called like. Uh, Days of Future Present? Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Boy, that's a weak name when you say it out loud. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't work as well. Yeah, he, he did He did at least one or two of those annuals. Um, but, you know, he's a one or two comic a year guy, you know? Yeah, not, not, a, not it's an event whenever uh, one of his comics would come out. So here's your Batman Black and White number four of four, wrapping that one up. And by the way, Katsuhiro Otomo in this, you know, yeah. like, talk about a heavy hitter that you're getting. Brian Bullen has that great story in there. Um, that was such a cool miniseries, and... It is funny that it's barely. I think it was a news item, maybe in Wizard. Right. Almost no coverage of that. Yeah, it's such a such an oddball product. Right. That they don't, you know. Somebody's they, a Kane fan. They keep listing Kane, which I don't object to, but it's surprising to see a, a a very very small indie crime comic, black and white, there. Month after month, though, they they give it some ink. Makes you wonder if it's just a matter of like get your press release to them, maybe on time, and maybe you get you get some juice. So Hitman is out. That, that really hasn't been covered that much. Hitman 5. And we haven't done any Hitman on the channel yet. So uh, I have trades. Like, I don't have the single issues. I wasn't picking it up. I'd be up for checking that out because I have not read Hitman. Yeah. And I kind of like John McCrea. Uh, McCrea is how I call McCray. it. McCrea. Like, his stuff's so so different. You it know, is. And I like that. It so, is. Uh, I'd be curious to check out some Hitman. So I was not... Like, I did not pick up Hitman because I was not a fan of that artwork. But I've... Once you start drawing and you realize like who the drawers are, like you come around and I'm a big uh, McCray guy also. You know what I have of his is Dick's, the yeah. Caliber series. That I think, I think <laughs> Garth Bennis <laughs> also writes that one. <laughs> you know what's funny in the uh, five-year recap, they talk about like Toy Biz releasing figures and it'll be like 50 figures one year. Thir you know, 30 figures one year. Like, they were just dumping stuff out there Absolutely. on the market. I mean, I dude, I still have my Gideon figure, you know what Gideon. I mean? <laughs> I, I have them, dude. I, I, I would scoop them all up. The MTV News, dude. This is a fascinating article. Um, we've talked a little bit about some of the, like, the bumper animations that MTV would play. Like, they straight maybe, up mentioned it here, dude. The cartoon sushi bumpers. They do a bunch of stuff. A lot of different things. From MTV News, having Sienkiewicz talk about Lone Wolf and Cub. Like, way more MTV coverage of anime and manga than I realized. Totally, man. A lot of Kurt Loder stuff. It would be on the MTV News, man. And they would uh, did, did uh, Akira coverage. And they were trying to figure out how to get Akira on the tube on MTV. But it, it pushed beyond... It pushed beyond, like, what the bumpers do. Because, like, the bumpers for Ninja Scroll are the bloodiest pieces. Right. You know, it's the most provocative imagery that doesn't have titties, you know? And, but, like, if you do, if you release a full movie of that, like, the the little, you know, the parental chip or whatever that was, like, in your remote control, like... You, it crosses the it crosses boundaries. Right. Uh, it says their policy is not to air anything completely unsuitable for those under twelve. I feel like there were a lot of questionable music videos. I mean, the fire, 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 Beavis and Butthead stuff. You know. Yes. Yeah. But it's still really fascinating. Like talk about like a column of history here. Amazing to think of just how much how much anime was shown to millions of people who did not see it anywhere else and were probably like, I remember my reaction to seeing those bumpers and just being like, what is this? Totally. And, and uh, like, I had to see, seek it out because, like, the cool thing was they would, at the Cartoon Sushi uh, Marathon, they would have um, the credits for the bumper. So, so like, that's how you get the, you know, the name Ninja Scroll. And uh, Ninja Scroll is the first thing I bought from a comic book store. So it's that late. It's like 95 or something. Um, even their sidebars are pretty good. The Ghost in the Shell is making it to video. Amazing. As good a look in anime as I've seen. Um, just a production, you know, almost a different media in some ways. But this Star Blazers, I did not realize what this was because I see these issues in dollar bins. Uh -huh. I guess it's an English adaptation. You know, they list some of the creators. The way it's written here, it's kind of confusing. Like, is it manga? But I don't think it is. I think no. it's English. I think it's an adaptation, and it's done by American artists, writers, because you see, like, one three-parter by Bruce Lewis, um, who would do, like, uh, Robotech comics. So it's, it's like, I guess a mara manga is the way you would describe it. Yeah. Like, but an adaptation of uh, Battleship Yom Yomoto. I'm quite sure that uh, 
Kamiko did a run, mm-hmm. and and it might be just the reprints of that stuff. But in recent years, you know, it's Leiji Matsumoto is is the uh, is the creator. And in recent years, that Seven Seas Entertainment, like we did a video showing off like all the new kind of classic reprints, and uh, Space Battleship Yamoto, which is Star Blazers, like gets the full treatment. So you could buy one book that has the full run. Plus, if you're a Matsumoto head, Leiji Matsumoto. Uh, there's like three volumes of Captain Harlock that you could get. So, uh, yeah, the the Lord's work is being done. And these are comics that I've been wanting to read, like his version. Right. Like when you know, when you find out that there's a real version out there, you don't want the fucking Gaijin version. And he's dope, by the way. Great cartoonist. All right. Drawing board. We saw them holding up that piece whenever they were like deciding on artwork. Yeah, the uh, the only future pro that I that I recognize... Is um, Lionel Yu. Yes, he's and, been in previous issues. Yes, at least two times. And I th- wonder if this is a repeat. Like, I wonder if this was in the last Lionel Yu thing. Yeah, the Batman looks familiar. I don't remember that that Joker piece. The problem, the problem is, is that uh, when I was a kid buying these magazines and reading them and rereading them a million times, it's really burnt into my head. Yeah. You know? Wish they had the ages. They used to do that. I think, like, some issues, they'll, they'll have the uh, ages listed. Yeah. Wish that was listed. Top 10 comics, I mentioned Preacher number one, Hitman there in the number two slot. So Garth Ennis, really up there. And Witchblade in three and four, Garth Ennis is doing Darkness. So, yeah. you know, it's almost like the adjacent book to Witchblade. A lot of heat in that in that section. You know, it's almost like you catch these moments of lightning in a bottle. Yeah. And you want to build on them, which, uh, you know, they seem to do. This, this I... I usually skip over these contests, but 101 comics you win, or 1,001 comics that you win, they don't have the list of the comics, and they have a couple of things like Amazing Spider-Man 23, Kamiko Primer number two, you know, like stuff that has, it's enticing, makes me curious, like, what are they all? (laughs) I bet a lot of it is the stuff we see exactly right here, like Chapel and stuff. How about this? Sponsored by Joseph Koch's Avalanche of Wonder, Joe Koch, or Coke, has a warehouse in Brooklyn yeah. that is pretty legendary. Yeah. So uh, you wonder where the rest of his comics went to. That's uh, that's it's a Brooklyn address. He was so, getting um, a chaff out of out of his uh, space. That's one of those destinations I wouldn't mind seeing see, finding myself in that warehouse one of these days. Uh, back issue info: Kingdom Come, obviously popular. Kind of the same on your top ten uh, artists and, and writers. Usually, not a lot of churn there. The top hundred's always fun. You see Spawn fifty. Uh, a little bit of a gimmick issue since it's a 50, but hey, claiming that top spot, you know, however you get there, that's a big deal. Kingdom Come, DC with a big debut, and Gen 13 in the top 10, which would be, that book was a hit. Oh yeah, absolutely. We're, we're going to start waning because I don't know how much longer J. Scott Campbell's going to be on that book. And they already have like fill-in issues here and there and stuff, which 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 got me off of it actually. And I might have I think I put together more of uh, J. Scott Campbell's run like over time in the quarter bins. But uh, whenever, you know, Al Rio or whoever those guys start showing up and too much, I'm like, okay, I'm done. Like you, it's a real lesson. Like you really want to try to keep the sexy creative team that made the thing popular on the book. Cause like, you know, when, when Greg Capullo becomes a spawn guy, I'm done. Yeah. And that book really hurt the gen 13 because it's like there is a kid a youth energy not every artist has that that's true and and if you take that away it takes a lot of charm out of there a lot of dc books here in this mid-range it's kind of funny to see that gigantic block of stuff that they are uh that that they're putting together but there are names like chaos crusade that are top 25 comics chaos a lot tops dark horse like this is probably about as diverse publisher wise of a top 25 as you're going to see in these wizard charts yeah and I think that speaks to the chaos of what's going on at this time. Right. I'm going to look at Miracle Man real quick. Let's see if we're there yet. Yeah, we should have one of these episodes sometime and really make everybody eat mad when okay. we just go through the uh, through the price guide because Femforce caught my eye and okay. I was like, Femforce, what are they selling? So, so dude, this is officially the issue. So, so in that top 100 uh, comics to have on your shelf, uh, the sort of like side note, was um they mentioned miracle man one through 16 this is the very first time where it's anything more than anything else and they call it scarce yeah and it's 12 bucks here it was just a two dollar book like the last issue or something like this should be you know blue or yellow or whatever the fuck yes 
because it was just a regular issue last thing. And it's going to show up on that good and cheap at some point, And then it just fucking skyrockets and never stops. I like to imagine this is, uh, they're cleaning out their Valiant. Right. Their, their Valiant uh, insider trading lots. Because they mentioned that in their top 100 <laughs> and then blow it up here in their price guide. <laughs> Aquaman character profile. Just, yeah, just fanboy shit. Hey, you know what, what is on here? A hard-boiled computer game. Yeah, for, for Sega Saturn. And they show a screen capture, which leads me to believe that it exists. But I don't know anything about it. Yeah, 3D graphics on it, too. Yeah, it's that, it's that era. Yeah. It's that era. Nice Jeff Darrow cover art. And our wizard profile, Todd McFarlane. Um, any takeaways from, from this very competitive guy, you know, it's kind of the origin that we've covered in previous interviews with him and stuff like that. So, so we, we, we covered some, some, uh, spawn, spawn comics, like some of his, like, I was going to call them late period, but it's just late period for me. Um, and we use the term folk art and outsider art, and that's something I've been reading about a lot lately, the history of it, some of the sort of big, big namers there. And like one of the major pieces to be considered like folk art outsider art is like lack of um education in in the craft and he possesses that self-taught it's all over this thing which is another sort of point towards the folk art aspect of like what spawn is you know he's he's a uh he's an outsider guy man he is and i wonder about that you know because it's fun to say self-taught and i sometimes say that you know like i didn't take any comic classes or whatever but he does have a graphic design degree. And like, I've also read in interviews where he talks about that, you know, like some of the infinity ink stuff being a lot more oh, yeah. wild layouts oh, yeah. and consciously going away from that to be a little bit more readable and his popularity skyrockets. It seems like he's very conscious of that part of it. And maybe that's not something that we think about in terms of comic book right. illustration, but I do <laughs> think he's conscious of it and does think about that and, and applies it very well. So you and Todd have the same education, right? Yes. You're a graphic design dude. Yeah, I did something wrong somewhere, I guess. Well, you don't you didn't, didn't play a D1 baseball. Maybe. Um, first comic read, Jerry Lewis comic. Looking at some Neil Adams, maybe. That could be, man. <laughs> that could be. Um, Detective Comics is a favorite. That's uh, that's kind of interesting. I guess he's done some Batman, but but not a ton. As a kid, it was his Hot Wheels. It was his favorite toy. His adult, his funny car. And Love you know what this. that funny car is? Person you would most want to meet? Hook me up with Jesus Christ. <laughs> such an answer Tracy Chapman favorite musical performer oh fascinating last good book was Helter Skelter yeah right he didn't read that so kind of fun he does talk about like uh he has no habits anymore time just isn't there he goes and runs his empire and then at five o'clock he has nothing left yeah. I don't listen to much music. I don't watch much television. I just play sports, bounce my kid, kiss my wife, call it a day, and start it all over again. Yeah, it certainly seems like a workaholic. He's he's always uh he's always been that way too. He's always promoted that that idea that that like the last thing I want to do is read a comic at the end of my work day after I'm drawing. And and uh, as a kid reading those like little snippets and interviews and stuff, like I just could not relate. I couldn't imagine that part where it's like 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 my love for the the medium is like so much deeper that like sure i will put in that whole day's work but also like when i'm hit, when i hit the treadmill like on the lectern is comics for like you know two hours a day yeah you know what this is pretty great there's uh there's some you know give us some parting wisdom and he says uh I've always stood up for what I believed in. If you're getting screwed in life, then move on and stop bitching. I'd rather leave that with a kid than this is how you draw Spider-Man. I love it. Yeah, yeah. Well, if we could if we could put that message out to the people of the internet. Yeah, I think it's kind of cool. And he seems very self-aware to put that out there. So interesting note to leave uh, five years of wizard on. Yeah, man. Wow. What a, what a journey, Ed. We yeah, talked about sure. wizard for probably 75 hours at this point. Uh, just with the record button on yeah and, and 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 what that signifies really is the speculator boom that we were a part of that was kind of the genesis point for the cartoonist kayfabe project uh we grew up within that speculator market it, it was 
there was so much value for somebody who's going to grow up to become a cartoonist in that space because the most popular comics were drawn by guys that looked like they made achievable artwork, I'll, I'll, I'll say, in a, in a diplomatic sort of fashion. Uh, so we cut our puppy teeth on that kind of stuff. It's something we know really well, and we use Wizard as the MacGuffin to to carry that conversation on. I don't know how much more Wizard coverage we'll be, we'll be doing, because there's very slim pickings. There's some some decent stuff coming up sooner than later, like the Adam Warren is going to be doing the drawing uh, stuff. But <laughs> I think we covered almost everything that I have in my mind. There's a Randy Bowen, like how to sculpt shit where he makes a, a Boba Fett um, statue that is fucking super cool. But that might be it. Hey, these are all new issues for me, so I have no idea what's coming up. Yeah. Um, but fortunately, we do have, have a about... lot of 80s coverage with Amazing Heroes comic scene, and we've got mostly the history of comics journal going from the late 70s up. So there's definitely a lot more comics history we can look at outside of Wizard as well. Yeah, Jimmy, it's been a pleasure uh, this past nearly five years uh, c covering this stuff. And uh, very serendipitous that we are looking at this five-year anniversary joint of uh, Wizard Magazine. If you're good to go, I'm good to go. Let's do it. Okay, Fabers, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell so that we can notify you when new videos are available. We are a daily YouTube channel, and we have uh, nearly, if not more than, 1,500 videos that are live at this very moment. Uh, if you go to the ma magnifying glass on the front page of the Cartoonist Kayfabe YouTube channel... Pop in uh, some of your favorite titles. Maybe we talked about them. You know, it's it's it's. There's a rare kayfaber who who has watched all of the those videos, but they they are out there. Uh, so you you don't know well you don't know what's out there, man. So give it a search. If we did not cover your faves, then uh, make sure that you put something in the comments so that we can push those comics a little bit higher up on our reading list. We have a Patreon for our supporters who want to directly contribute to cartoonist kayfabe. And uh, the King Kayfabers on that Patreon get access to all the videos before anybody else. They're hanging out in the chat right now. We got about three dozen dudes kicking it in the uh, in the chat room at this very moment, adding some context. And after we hit stop this record, we kick it with them for a, a little bit. It's almost like we have private episodes directly for them. Ultimately, the videos are brought to you by the books that we make. And before you is a pretty healthy sample of uh, a lot of our covers and comics that we have out in the wild. But... We are working in functioning cartoonists, and uh, we need you to uh, support our newest books. So, Jimmy, let the people know what you have going on. Street Angel, Princess of Poverty is my next release. This will be out from Image Comics in November, but you can pre-order this one now at your local comic book store or online wherever you buy comics. This is a companion title to Street Angel, Deadliest Girl Alive. Together, these two books will collect all of my Street Angel comics. They're basically a two-book set. Hulk Grand Design, my contribution to the Grand Design series of books, features 60-year history of the Incredible Hulk, along with several of the top artists that drew the Hulk, and you can pick that one up now while supplies last, and they are out of print at the distribution level, so get it at your local comic shop if they still have a copy or online, wherever you can find it, because once this is out of print, I have no idea what Marvel's plans will be to, to bring it back or to do more of it. I've also been self-publishing. These are two of my latest zines, the BW zine celebrating the black and white explosion comics of the 80s, uh, 1986 celebrating the best year in comics history, and True Crime Funnies, three nonfiction stories in this comic book. These will all be available in late October, October 26th. Mark it on your calendar. I'm going to be selling them on my website. If you can't wait that long, you can read these on my uh, Patreon, patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. The time has come. I need you guys to order Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus through your comic shop because the print run is here and it's coming out uh, within like four weeks of uh, this, this recording session. 10 year anniversary of Hip Hop Family Tree, 50th anniversary of Hip Hop as a Culture, and this is the best book that I've made so far in my life. So I really hope you add it to, uh, to your bookshelf coming October 18th. Uh, plenty of time for the holidays. It's going to be a great Christmas gift because, uh, you know, the comics world is a niche world, but the rap music transcends, right? So you put this in somebody's uh, stocking, they're going to have their freaking minds blown. This is the kind of book, like I used to say, like, buy comics for everybody for Christmas. Oh, yeah. This is a book you can give somebody that doesn't read comics. Exactly. Exactly. And I like making those kind of comics. X-Men Grand Design Trilogy trade paperback is coming out in November. What you're looking at is one of the uh, Treasury editions, or should I say Ed Piscor editions, of uh, the original X-Men Grand Design. But a couple of those volumes out of print. 
so we are ganging them up and putting out a, a, a nice you know Marvel trade paper back in November. Also, just in time for the holidays uh, for the uh, you know the X Men lover in your life. The current focus has been Red Room. Two trade paperbacks of that are out there in the world. Anti Social Network and Trigger Warnings. We just completed the four issue run of the last season of Red Room called Crypto Killers. And uh, this third issue has a backup feature called uh, Latchkey Kids, which I've retitled as uh, Switchblade Shorties. And these characters are going to be the focus of the daily comic strip that I'm going to start to release to the wild January 1st, 2024. But uh, on my Patreon, uh, I'm exclusively sliding that out to, uh, to the audience there. So hit up my Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash edpiscor. You could uh, read several episodes of uh, Switchbelly Shorties. Um, there you have it. That's our bibliography, the books that we have out in the wild and forthcoming. But there are some other ways to support the channel. Let the people know, Jimmy. You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also pick up Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts, merchandise, mugs, hats, stickers, and lots more at our spread shop. That link is also under this video in the show notes. There it is, man. Buy our books, support the channel that way. But we laid out a number of ways that you could support the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. One final set of marching orders. Jimmy, let them have it. We'll be out of here. Read more comics.